what are we here for? We are here tonight to listen uh, to Ed Rios, uh, who will be telling us why he believes in God. And then he will be open to your questions. And following that, we will have the uh, rebuttal period when you can give your own testimonies of belief and unbelief. Uh, and whatever. The name is Ed Rio. Ed, you want me to try to help um, you with that mic? Yeah, because I, my voice might give out. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Well, what I'd like, I see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of regulars, and what I'd like to start off with is, and also a lot of missing regulars, um, but what I'd like to start off with is to thank the college. I've been coming to the college for 25 years, more or less, and I have learned absolutely so much here. It's a great place. Um, this talk is an ex is a continuation of my thoughts on uh, consciousness, which is the last talk I gave. And it's, it's my conclusion, in a sense. Right now, at that time, I was, like, I was at the point of saying that I, I know that there must be more than meets the eye. Yes, sir. But I wouldn't go to far, as far as saying there is a God. But definitely more than meets the eye. And now, I actually think there, that, that there, if there is, and if there isn't, there should be. Um, I'm going to start off by saying that the world around us we have man's scientific and economic progress versus man as a beast. Okay. And there's no doubt of man's scientific and economic progress. And there's also no doubt of man as a beast. Okay. The implications are many, and some of which are competition. Winning is good, losing is bad. Okay. People do many, many things not to lose. Okay. You have, in the man is a beast world, you have personal gain, personal loss, status, pecking order. Okay. And why I bring this up is because There is a competition between scientists and spiritualists. It's very, very, very old. I mean, from before the current European expression of this competition, okay, we've had like witch doctors, medicine men, and people saying it ain't so. Okay. Now, I find that that competition is inherent in man as a beast. Okay? It's like, if you have somebody who's saying that spirituality exists, and then you have somebody who else who says, the only thing I believe is what I can measure. The two don't meet. And I think that is a crime. 
Okay. What I'm going to get into is, let me explain it this way. Take Albert Einstein. People think about Albert Einstein as one of humanity's greatest scientists. But take what Albert did. Take the scientific method. Scientific method is propose a theory, create an experiment, carry out the experiment, modify the theory, do it again. Okay. <coughs> Albert never did an experiment. Okay. Albert, his experiments, every once in a while, he would do what he called thought experiments. Never did hard science in the sense of hard science being an experiment. What Albert really was, was Albert was a theoretical physicist. Not exactly a scientist. A subgroup. Okay. What I want to bring to the table tonight is the subgroup of theoretical spiritualists. Okay? Somebody who isn't afraid to be theoretical about the world. Not the world, but about the fact that there is more in the world than meets the eye. Okay? So, as the world's first announced theoretical spiritualist. I'm going to continue this discussion. Okay. You have to realize that there's a thin line between theory and speculation. There are some things that were not even speculation. Well, there are things that were speculation. For example, back in the 1700s, someone discovered a vaccine for chickenpox. Okay. It was it was developed from the observation that milkmaids rarely got chicken pox. Smallpox. Smallpox? Yeah, small Alright, smallpox. Thank you. <laughs> Developed from the observation that milkmaids rarely got smallpox. And what it was is somebody took cowpox and inoculated people with the cowpox. And doing that, they created a vaccine. They put to work a vaccine that protected people from smallpox. There was no science. Pure observation. Speculation. Okay? They didn't know what bugs were. They didn't know what germs were. They had no idea of the microbial world. They had no theory. They had nothing. It was just speculation. Scientists have something called the scientific method, which, you know, came up a little earlier. But scientists are people too. And now we, you know, we get to the beast that make up people. This is a section of an article. This is the paper it came from. This section will go around the room, and I will read a little bit to, to you. Scientist's elusive goal, reproducing study results. Title. Two years ago, a group of Boston researchers published a study describing how they had destroyed cancer tumors by targeting a protein called SDK33. 
Scientists at Amgen Inc. quickly pounced on the idea and assigned two dozen researchers to repeat their experiment with the goal of turning the findings into a drug. It proved to be a waste of time and money. After six months of intensive lab work, Amgen found that it couldn't replicate the results and scrapped the project. Glenn Begley, VP of Research at Amgen, says, quote, I was disappointed but not surprised. More often than not, we are unable to reproduce findings published in research journals. This, this is one of medicine's dirty secrets. Most results, including those that appear in top-flight peer-reviewed journals, can't be reproduced. It's a very serious and disturbing issue because it's obviously misleading people whose implicit trust in findings published in a respected peer-reviewed journal. Da, da, da. Reproducibility is the foundation of all modern research, the standard by which scientific claims are evaluated. In the U.S. alone, Biomedical research is a $100 billion enterprise. Here's the graph. No cure, it says here. When Bayer tried to replicate results of 67 studies published, by, published in academic journals, two-thirds failed. Two-thirds could not be replicated. 20% fully replicated, 10% partials. So, what I'm saying is that scientists are people too. Scientists have all the pressures that people have. They have peer reviews, they have bills to pay, they have places, they have status. They put things out that no one can repeat. But what are you going to do? They're people. If anyone wants to see the full article, Okay, now, I'm gonna, now, I don't know, I'm gonna, now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to talk without this. Paul, you want some dessert? No, these cake. I have, um, can you hear me back? Sure, sure. Well, yeah. But or plane. If you try to switch, maybe you might get better uh, output with the mic. If you can hear me, we're doing fine. It's inconsistent. Okay. This is going to be something about what we all know of or learned many years ago. And that's going to be the simple equation that our circumference Paul, is sorry. directly the proportional cherry cheesecake. to the I'm diameter. I'm sorry. And it's expressed okay. as Do you want C else? equals pi Do you want me to leave you open? Do you have a couple pi? Okay. I do. Okay, I'll pi on it. If you have a pin, and you, it has a certain circumference. And you increase that circumference by adding 30 something feet to it, 32 feet to it. How much do you increase the diameter? You increase the diameter by 10 feet, more or less. Okay? It's directly proportional by pi, pi, 3.14, dot, dot. So the head of a pin, Increase the circumference by 
32 feet, let's say, all right, you have a, you increase the diameter by, by 10. Now, let's take a basketball. Do the same thing. Take the circumference of a basketball, increase it by 32 feet. How much have you increased the diameter? 10 feet. Let's take the circumference of the earth. Okay, 24,000 miles. Okay. Let's say you increase the circumference of the earth by 32 feet. How much do you increase the diameter? 10 feet. 10 feet. Directly proportional. Let's say you take the circumference of the orbit of Pluto. Increase that length by 32 feet. How much do you increase the diameter? 10 feet. 10 feet. Ten feet. Directly proportional. Okay? It's amazing but true. One of the amazing things about that is that pi is an infinite number. It's, it's either, it's, it's a progression. There's no end to it. Okay? It's like 3.14159 dot 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 All right? It keeps going. And strangely, that means that you can't know the diameter and the circumference of a circle. Because if you decide on the diameter and you multiply by pi, which is an unending number, you get a circumference that is just how fine do you want to know it. Okay? And in a strange way, that's I forgot the guy's name. Heidelberg, Heidelberg, the uncertainty principle. Heisenberg. 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 Heisenberg's uncertainty Anything principle. Else? Very simple. Where you could know either the what, momentum and location, or but you couldn't know both. Okay. It's like you can know the you can pick the diameter but you can't exactly know their circumference. And the funny thing about that is, you can draw it on paper, even though you can't. Very strange. So I'll give you another equation that's in that form. E equals mc squared. Okay? It's the exact same form as C equals pi D. You have two variables related directly by a constant. Okay. In the case of E equals MC squared, C squared is a huge number. Okay? Meaning that there's an awful lot of energy contained in a little bit of math. Directly proportional. E equals mc squared. Now, we come to the scientists again. The scientists have developed a theory of multi-universes. Okay? 
And they developed this theory in response to the enigma, the problem of Schrodinger's cat. Okay. Schrodinger's cat is the problem of which I if, is the problem of a cat in a box. Okay. The box is not transparent. The cat is in there with a radioactive element and a Geiger counter and a hammer and a flak and a vial of poison. Okay. And the thing is that when the radioactive element decays, the Geiger counter goes off. The output from the Geiger counter trips the hammer, which breaks the vial, which kills the cat. The problem is that until someone observes the cat, actually it's not, the problem is that until someone observes the decay of the radioactive element, it hasn't really happened. It's in a state of superposition where both release, decay, and non-decay exist simultaneously. It isn't until the observer comes in that you have something called the collapse of the wave function and you get one or the other. Okay. Well, everybody, no one could answer that. And then in the 60s, someone came up with the answer that there must be multiple universes where both exist, where it's like it can go this way in this universe and that way in that universe. And everybody was happy. <laughs> And today, shush, and today, everybody, not everybody, but today, scientists will talk about multiple universes. Not all of them, but they're a lot. Okay. Now, back to E equals MC squared. Think of this universe we're in now, right? And all the energy that's in it, huge amount of energy, okay? Think of it being replicated out of nothing okay? because the universe is like bifurcated. It's splitting. It's like this one and that one. And then think of it happening again. And again. And again. And ever and ever. And again, 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 again. Where does all this energy come from? Okay. I don't believe it. it it's not. It's theoretical. Nobody can prove it. It answers one of their problems. They talk about it. They've never demonstrated it. All right? But it does pay the bills, publish papers. Life is good. String theory. String theory is another one. Theoretical. Okay? Einstein was theoretical. These are more theoretical physicists. No one can devise an experiment to prove or disprove it. It's, it's, it's men and women making a living 
Life is good. My theories. What I need is a good experiment, because I'm just a theoretical spiritualist. We need a good experiment. Someone who can come up with experiments. Okay. There is a thought, another theory, that for lack of a better word, the word spiritualism is, comes with a lot of baggage. All right? But for lack of a better word, I'm using it. There is a theory that basically there is no spirit. Everything is chemistry. Everything is cause and effect. There is no spirit. Okay. And the consciousness that we feel please yes <clears throat> is a result arises from the complexity of the brain okay. there's a thought that someday machines there will be a machine that achieves consciousness. If, and if the thought comes from an extension of the idea that there is no spirit and consciousness is just arises out of complexity. In our case, human case, we have an awful lot of neurons in the brain. Awfully complex. Okay. So, when you say that consciousness arises out of complexity, in our case, causal. But take it down the line. Right. Go down, down to cats, all right. down to fish, down to invertebrates, down to worms, go even lower, all right. go down to microbes, protozoa, all right. absolutely no complexity in a protozoa, no nervous system, okay? <coughs> No nervous system, nothing to create consciousness. Right? And if you believe that there is no spirit, then you believe that the actions of a protozoa are evolutionary adaptations to its environment. Yeah. Even though there is no training, there is no mommy protozoa, no daddy protozoa, no kinder protozoa or kindergarten. Okay? Nothing to learn from no one teaching nobody or anybody. Alright? But, because we want to be theoretically consistent, we have to say that a protozoa's reaction to its environment is an environmental adaptation. It's an adaptation to its environment. Well, I find that explanation to be simply words, you know? 
I'll give you an example of words. Many years ago, I was sitting in front of my television watching Doctor Who. And if you know Doctor Who, he lives and he travels in a machine called the TARDIS. And the machine is bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. On the inside, it may be as big as this room. On the outside, it's as big as the old-fashioned London police. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. So one day in this episode, Doctor Who was asked, why is it bigger on the inside than on the outside? And the doctor said, my friend, my friend, come here. And he held up a glass. And he said, you see this glass? He says, hold it up to your eye and look at the, at the police box. You see how this glass, even though it is much smaller than the police box, when you hold it up to your eye, encompasses the whole box. And the human said, yes, I do. And Doctor Who said, that, my friend, is trans-dimensional engineering. And I was sitting at the television going, trans-dimensional engineering, oh yeah, now I understand. Ah. And to my shame, 10 seconds later, not immediately, the light bulb went off and I said, what? Trans-dimensional engineer, what the? <laughs> okay. So, here's what scientists say. And believe me, I've got nothing against scientists except their dogma that there is no spirit. Okay? Here's what scientists say. Until an observer observes, It, this thing exists in a state of superposition. And actually, this whole superposition idea is very, very strong in scientific circles. Okay. Until an observer observes it, it exists in superposition. Both exist. And when an observer observes it, we have the collapse of the wave function. And voila, reality ensues. I think saying the collapse of the wave function is like saying transdimensional engineering. It doesn't tell you shit. You know, it's a phrase that kind of answers a question, that gives you a cubbyhole, that makes your mind happy. Collapse of the wave between the scientists who are only reproducible 20% of the time and a new group 
group of people we're going to call theoretical spiritual. Because religious people, just like scientists, two sides of the coin that we call humanity are just not, they, they definitely come with their own back. Okay. But the scientists don't escape the back. What we do is take the scientific method, which isn't a study, which isn't a, it's a method, okay, and apply it to this, to what makes more sense to me, which is that a spirit does exist. Okay? For me, to say that a protozoa is a life form, all right? but it has a spirit. A mosquito is a life form that has a spirit. A mosquito, as I understand the world, has the tiniest of nervous systems. And yet, it's able to fly, find me, avoid my hand, find a mate, that and that all its needs, all right, in this insignificant number of neurons. I don't think that it's doing that because complexity leads to consciousness. I think that insignificant number of neurons in a mosquito are just not complex. I think that it is able to do everything it does because there's a spirit there. <coughs> Let's take humans, and by humans I don't mean people who, like us, are fully ambulatory, speak clear enough, etc. But the range of humans, Okay. They're all capable, have various capabilities. Okay. Some of them, humans that exist in a vegetative state, have very, very little capability. Okay. Have very what? Little capability. There's a book called Stroke of Insight. Okay. It was written by a scientist, PhD, I believe, from Indiana, who also worked at MIT. Her specialty was the brain, the, the physical brain. And when she was in her mid-30s, she had a stroke. She went from great book, first two-thirds. She went from living in her left hemisphere, which was, which is, in us, the location of all our compare and contrast the file storage bin, the scientific side, the language center. Okay. She went and that left hemisphere was damaged severely. Okay. She writes how the book starts off with the day of the stroke. Then it goes into the treatment, 
and then it goes into recovery. Okay. And it's from her perspective as a scientist. She writes how when she lost the function of her left side, what happened to her was the chatter, the dialogue, the compare and contrast, the scientist, conversation, all of that went away. And she writes how <coughs> she was then a creature of the right side of her brain. And she writes some things about feelings, feelings of peace, feelings of oneness, da, da, da. read the book. But she was, she went from being totally capable like us to being very, very, very limited. Couldn't walk, couldn't talk, couldn't talk. Okay. So, as a theoretical spiritualist, what do I say? She also never distinguishes between her as the observer and any of these conditions. Very strange. What do I say? She basically, she fully recovered by the way. Took her 10 years, but she fully recovered. What's her name? I don't know. But that's the book. All right. Insight of, stroke of insight. Okay. She fully recovered. When she recovered 10 years later, she wrote the book, that and that, life was good. You take her as a scientist working in Indiana, working at MIT, all right, and take her as a invalid. Basically, and coming out of that invalid to be, to regaining her previous former life. Okay. That she as a spiritual, <coughs> theoretical spiritual. I say that the spirit that animated her, in either case, was the same. Okay. What was different was her, her body's ability to communicate with us, to do all the things that she could do before. Where I am now is that there's no distinction between spirits. The spirit in a cat and the spirit that animates me are equally powerful or animated. What is the difference is that a cat or a protozoa have a certain amount of tools <coughs> to communicate with each other, with the outside world, to make it better. But the spirit that animates that is the same. Okay. Now, the cat spirit, the dog spirit, the mosquito spirit, all the same spirit? Not the same spirit, I mean, but have the same power. <coughs> no, I don't believe that there's an evolution of spirit. I don't believe that there is the, the spirit that animates me is superior to the spirit that animates worm. Now, the difference between scientists who refuse to see a spirit side leads them to this. Thermodynamics. 
There's a law in thermodynamics that says everything goes to greater than zero. <coughs> that things will simply become unorganized. That if things organize, someone put work into it. And yet, here we all are. If believing that there is no spirit means that we are all chemistry, I think you'll correct me. First law of thermodynamics, is it? Entropy? Second. Second law? Hmm? So, here we are, in spite of what they call a law, which says that everything in the universe will tend to greater confusion. And yet, here we are. If life was just chemistry, if we were just the periodic table, and that's all that existed, then what is the force that is driving life? Life is organization. Life is highly organized. Life is not disorganization. If life was, if science is right, and all we have is a periodic table, there should be no life. Because things do not organize. And yet, we find things evolving into greater complexity. That is the earth to you. Okay. I think that the scientific method should be applied across the board. I think that trying to understand the physical world we live in without including the spiritual element is indefensible. <coughs> God. Okay. <coughs> Why I believe in God? I believe in God because I believe in the spirit, the concept of spirit. What would God be to a lion? Probably something that had great claws, terrific teeth, and could roar, be heard around the world. Okay. What would God be to a man? Well, for the beast in us, God would be wise, da da da, so on and so forth. The creation that we are burdened with when we say the word God. Okay. Spirit exists. We are totally incapable of conceiving God. We come up with questions that are like, if God is all powerful, can he or she make a rock that is too heavy for him to pick up? Great question. We're not capable of conceiving. Right? God is, to me, God exists. I can't conceive of it. God is a path. A path. God is like that. 
I simply can't conceive of it, but the world makes so much more sense to me. When I include the spirit, I Define spirit and what you mean more equivocably by the word spirit. <laughs> Maybe a good word is consciousness. Okay. Spirit, consciousness, that all the words we use come with much baggage. All right? But by me, spirit is the thing that, again, with much baggage but the thing that animates spirit is the thing that collapses the wave function you know spirit is the observer my eyes are not the observer okay in in me, all right, I have light hitting my eyes, turning into chemical signals, into electrical impulses, into the brain, which is what I actually conceive of, conceive, but spirit is the consciousness that Con that makes sense, lack of a better so of that sight. So basically then what you're telling us is that everybody has a soul. Yeah. Everything actually. Which Everything. is what Everything. Isn't that what Buddhists have believed for years and eons? It's possible. I don't know Buddhism. Yes. Spirit, not Ziva. Does it have any morality? Does it judge people? Does it send them to heaven or hell? Or is it just a greater power? Or is it just a different power? It's not something I conceive of. It's a, it's a direction. It's a path. All right? I mean, the, the great burden is to make sense of life, you know? If everything is a spirit, or is animated by a spirit, okay? What sense do we make of the lion killing the lamb, you know? Of, of any of us and the tragedies that happen, of good and evil, you know? God Spirit, I can defend. God, I can only say, is something that I believe in and I will walk towards. Unless you just right. be a deist. Possible. Yeah, and uh, what happens to these spirits when the when body dies? No, I don't care to speculate. Yeah, uh, you know, you when you got to around the, talking about spirit, you said it was the same in all creatures. The, the spirit of a cat or a dog is the same as the spirit that's within us humans. Uh, but I wrote out a question, and I don't know, and the question I had was, uh, what is the source of the spirit? Now, at the end of your talk, you introduced God, but um, I was looking for you to somehow tie God in with the Spirit, and you didn't. Yeah. And why, why did you avoid that? I, I, I can't, for the life of me, conceive of God. You know? 
The only thing I can say is form. I can conceive of spirit. Okay. I can't conceive of God. Alright, why do I believe God exists in addition to spirit or in addition to the soul? Why do I think that makes sense to me? Let's take man and let's pretend that man is going to create God in his own image. All right? Make a God. It's going to be the god of Mount Olympus, the god of Vishnu and Krishna, the god of, okay? It's going to be something relatable, right? Let's take the opening passages of the Judeo-Christian Muslim tradition. Beginning was the word. And then there was light. What human being thinks of God in terms like that? And then there was light. And then God created the land of the planets and the world. And we had the ocean, and the land rose amidst the waters. Close. And now we have scientists telling us, in the beginning there was light. And in the beginning, the land mass was just one, which then started to drift apart. Okay. And then we have the Judeo Christ, the Judeo belief. Right? And then we have the Christian one thrown on top of that. Right? And then we have the Muslims come along. And what does Mohammed say? But basically, there is one God. And his name is Allah. Whatever. Okay. And it's like the Christians took God, made him into a God the Father, the Holy Ghost. All right? And 800 years later, that version was corrected. Okay? with a Muslim thing saying there is just one God. So, don't make me stand on this because it's really shaky, but there's a storyline through there. All right? Of like regression to the mean, it's like, no, there is one God, Abraham, to Jesus. God is love. Right. to Mohammed. Let's take Jesus out of this Jesus worship and go back to God. So, I'm like, there's a story there. There's a thread. I can walk towards God. Can't conceive of him. So, that's why you can't get me to tell you who, what, how big, how far. God. But do I believe in him? It makes, it makes more sense than not. That's it? Let's start the rebuttals. Uh, <laughs> uh, Charles? Yeah, uh, Ed, uh, I spoke here on Darwin and evolution. <clears throat> And in preparation, I did an awful lot of research and reading. And I found no one raised the issue of any omission 
in this explanation of the natural world. Can you just get your plate? Yes, okay. a deficiency. Okay. At all regarding as an explanation of the physical biological community that occupies the earth. There was no need for any open-endedness. I, why is this not sufficient? What do you find that's missing? <coughs> An explanation of provided by natural selection. Well, if you go back to thermodynamics, if life, if reality is just a periodic table, there should be no force, there is no force that drives organization. Yet, there has been, for billions of years, a drive towards higher organization. Right? And that chemistry and thermodynamics does not supply the answer to the creation of life. Chemistry says things should be more disorganized. You put a, you know, a drop of alcohol in a glass of water, and it spreads. So in order to have life, you have to have chemicals and something called spirit. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Why do you need chemicals? That's what I don't know. So you have a physical world. You need, you need the periodic table. If you don't have a periodic table, you don't have a physical world. Spirit can, does not exist. Apart from Say that? spirit, does not exist apart from stuff. Well, back to the question of what happens to spirit when there is no stuff. What happened? Where was spirit before stuff came about? You know, those are questions that I'd like to see people explore. I think that excluding spirit from the scientific method limits us. I think including spirit will lead us to better, better, better. One last follow-up. Do you think the study of spirit should be a scientific discipline? I think many, many, many things should be a scientific, should follow the scientific method. I also think a lot of scientists don't. Yeah. Um, <coughs> given that you know the scientific method maybe has existed for 400 years, and recorded history is maybe three or four thousand years, and archaeological evidence is maybe a hundred thousand years, and the vast majority of that time epic, I think, okay, here's why I postulate, uh, humanity, at least the majority of it, did believe in God's spirit. Why do you think? Or why do you caution, or why do you caveat your use of the word spiritualism with baggage? Because the baggage that comes with it is the inherent contrast with the scientific method. It's like if you talk, try to talk to someone who practices the scientific method and say to them that life could be the fourth thermodynamic rule, you know, law of thermodynamics, that life exists, or spirit, or consciousness exists, and it's driving the periodic table into an organization that becomes life, right? Um, yes? Uh, where? Well, I'm not sure if you assign any credibility to type to the mystical experiences that are kind of common in numerous religions. Uh, and, and if you do, how does that work uh, with your belief system? You know, um, I 
if you're a modern scientist, there's no room in your philosophy for a mystical uh, true or you know? I don't know about that. You're, you know, if you believe in more than meets the eye, right, then you allow for for consciousness. Now, spiritual experiences that people have, you got a lot of kinds, you know. It, it's, it's like, is my life by itself n not a, enough of a spiritual experience? You know, it's like, do I have to have a peyote high, right, to have something that's so unordinary that to find a proper label, I call it a spiritual experience. I, yeah. Um, so, basically, our, our spirits are more or less equal, uh, and they're, I guess, what neutral as far as like morality is concerned. So, what causes uh, somebody like uh, Hitler to do what Hitler did, and uh, versus uh, what causes uh, somebody? Uh, like, you know, Dr. Sock or something to do with Dr. Sock. And what causes life and death in the first place? I mean, wouldn't it be evolutionarily beneficial if we never die? If we simply created... Would that be evolutionary benefit? Evolutionary benefit? Yes. Well, no, because evolution is constantly trying new things, constantly trying right. new uh, mutations. For the world in general. Right. But how about for you as an individual? If you if you had a member of your family who had lived ten thousand years and knew of so many and had such experience that they could prepare you for things coming that they knew what was going, that they had such it's like <coughs> questions uh -huh. good, bad, life, death. It, it's, I'm all for studying, all right, but the answer to those, I know that, of course, we all know they exist. We don't have a framework for, well, I don't have a framework for why somebody chooses to do evil and why somebody chooses to do bad. Yeah. Uh, uh, hey, hey, not the same people. Yeah, so I. Yeah. Not as you need change that. No. Uh, you just sure? to your yeah. speech, uh, Ed, uh, you said you have nothing against science, scientists, so I assume that theoretic science, like the uh, brilliant man with the Einstein, the brilliant guy like Einstein, a theoretic physics, which is true, he ain't had a laboratory in his life. You're not against theoretic science, but what you, would I be right to say that you saying if, 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 if we can theorize about science, why can't we theorize about the spirit? Yeah, and to just, just combine them in life experience and our knowledge of the world. Okay, so follow up question to that would be, would you tell me why you think that these people will listen to some theories about monkey driving a car and not going about what one would say about the spirit, uh, even about the existence of a, a God? I mean, we should say like Aristotle, for example. Well, I forgot what I said. Okay. Play it back to. Would you say that, uh, that we should theorize about the spirit? It should be an acceptable practice for some of us to theorize about the spirit like some scientists, I understand, theorizing about physics. 
Um, I think the acceptable practice is to theorize about the spirit, Thank you, Robert. but with the same rigor that you can theorize about physics. It's like, right now, physicists are theorizing about things that they can't prove, and some of which I don't even believe are true any which way, all right? And the spirit, I want to throw into that mix, or consciousness, to throw into that mix, because I think it answers questions, and I think it will lead to a better understanding of the world. I have a question, and that is, uh, wouldn't uh, something like Dharma uh, have some sort of an explanation, uh, the transmigration of souls and so on, that are from the door, that is past existence, is past I, I understand the term karma, but not the term dharma. Can you explain dharma. that? Oh, <coughs> uh, dharma is the law of the uh, uh, karma. Uh, uh, dharma is the law of karma. according to a, a mind, uh, a principle uh, that guides the universe, uh, the protozoa, uh, you know, has, has a an existence, uh, a, a, an impulse that uh, that is also life well, or spirit. Uh, this is a confusion of ideas. I think. Uh, well, is this a comment or a question? I don't know. It sounds like a comment. It's going on for <laughs> 10 minutes like about serious. something. I don't know. Yeah. What <laughs> 10 minutes of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's go to rebuttals, Brom. Anybody who hasn't had a question? It doesn't matter. Brom, I, I, have, I have a suggestion. You formalized the concept of what goes around comes around. Well, that's not exactly the same thing. If there are no more questions, I'll sit down. Let's go to rebuttals. All right. Well, I had another question. Oh. <laughs> yeah. He wouldn't let me ask it. He started getting upset. Another question. All right. So you have to listen to right. 10 minutes of craziness. <laughs> <laughs> Charles and I have no. here's a discussion. Uh, Our bacteria in Antarctic, okay. frozen and unfrozen, come to life. Does that mean spirit? 
it can be frozen or what is it where does it go well uh, the other thing is spirit in a in a seed in in what so much in potential so spirit has a non-spirit state <laughs> that's two good questions and I will try to throw mud at the wall uh, and see what sticks okay. regarding a bacteria that is frozen in the rubble it's a spirit frozen kind of similar to a human that experiences a stroke, becomes a vegetative state, and then returns. Right? Kind of similar to that. You become non-human through a stroke? You remain human, but you, you are in a vegetative state. You're in a state that doesn't allow the spirit to function the way it would have if you were not suffering from that. And the spirit of the bacterium that's frozen, there you go, an analogy, all right? Should be studied scientifically, if anyone can think of a good experiment. The other one about, what was the other one, Charles? The seed of spirit. The seed. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, does a rock have spirit? Does sure. a coffee cup have spirit? I don't know. Do inanimate objects have spirit? Do you change them? Doesn't yeah. seem like it. I mean, I know there are people that believe the earth has a spirit. Is a spirit. Yeah. The earth okay. is a spirit? Yes. Yeah. But does, is, that the planet there? is there like a spirit of the table? Is there a spirit of every element on the periodic table? And not just one, but one spirit from any free atom that exists in this universe. Hmm. Don't think so. A seed, the potential in the seed. Okay, great question. But my thing is, is that let's include spirit in the discussion. In the, in the scientific method, throw it into our understanding of the world around us and see Why? where that takes us. Why? Because for me, it makes the world around me makes more sense when that's in it. It doesn't make sense to me that the world is simply the periodic table, that it's simply the elements that were and exploded the suns. <laughs> One last question. You want the scientists to verify the world religions? No. Um, no. Rose has the next question. I don't think they're going to do that. Well, Rose. You know, what I'm trying to talk about is including the concept of spirit or the concept of consciousness in our worldview and have scientists not be afraid of it. Okay? When you get into discussions of the questions that you brought up, it's religion. And I don't want to, I, I myself 
you know, don't want to go down a dogmatic religious path. It, it would be what? as if, you know, I was a scientist and thought that there were multiverses. I didn't hear the last sentence. It would be I think I think that religion is a belief system that I try to avoid. I think that consciousness exists and we should include it in our scientific thinking to get be, to have a more complete understanding of the universe. You said, but what is the because behind your, you don't want to go into that because? No, religion is, is like defining God. Religion is, how do you define God? How does a worm define God? How does a lion define God? How does a dog define God? If they, if they had these questions, all right? A lion would maybe define God as a bigger lion with huge teeth who could gobble the world in one, you know, claws the size of the moon who could take a swipe and knock the moon out of the sky. It's like we're totally incapable of defining boxing, defining God. You know, we are totally capable of creating religions. And like the gentleman said, we've been doing it for a long time. Right? Even knowing nothing about anything, we can still make religions. And answering, to answer the questions you brought up would be making up a religion. It's like, I, I don't want to go there. I would rather just see where the experiments take us, if anyone can. All right. Uh, Rebuttals from. All right. Uh, I, I, I do have a second question. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, is your spirit defining you? <laughs> a few years ago, I was at an airport, and I was waiting for someone to show up at baggage claim. And down the elevator, or escalator, <coughs> came a middle-aged woman and her very small son, a child. Sitting not far from me was the grandfather. Right? And when they saw each other, the little, the child, who couldn't run like smoothly yet, but could manage it, right? And the grandfather, who could no longer run smoothly, were approaching each other. All right? And I saw in them, like, I knew that the grandfather was once as small as that boy. I knew the grandfather was once as young as me. And I know the grandfather is as old as he is. All right? And all through that, this person was that, who he is. And the little child is also and I saw them running towards each other as like two life forms. Not an old person and a young person, but just two. Okay, now, does my spirit define me? Okay? No. Okay? Here's how it goes. My body has a certain biochemistry 
has a certain, takes some inputs and tends to view them in certain ways. Okay? And I find as I've gotten older that the things I did as a younger person no longer make sense. Okay? I, it's like they were very impulsive. They were very stupid. I am lucky I survived those things. All right? But I was driven by chemistry. And even though inside, as I look back through my lifespan, I am very, very familiar through all these stages of life to the person I am now. I know from my actions <coughs> that I behave very differently at different times, and it's all biochemistry. So, no, my spirit does not define me. It's like nurture, nature, environment. It's like the way my, I see the world is filtered and limited, you know, through whatever body this spirit exists, this spirit or consciousness, it, you know, inhabits. Well, all right, we will move to our rebuttal period. Thank you. Five minutes each. <laughs> <laughs> Remaining. So, about six seven minutes, minutes Brown. Piece, huh? About seven minutes would be a good one. Yeah, up to seven minutes. You don't have Frank, you need this. Oh, wait, you need this. Wait, 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 wait,
But do you know about entropy? Nothing. I mean, you, you don't know what entropy is. Uh, you don't know about the universe, how it functions, how the Big Bang, how the stars form, how the energy of the star filters through a, through a planet, and how that energy filters into making combinations of elements. Energy is the ones who permit those elements to convey. Sometimes with ultraviolet light, sometimes with heat, sometimes with direct uh, solar photons. Uh, so, going to heaven with mosquitoes. mosquitoes. <laughs> 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 You know, <laughs> collapse of the wave function, collapse of the wave function. Um, you know, I know yeah, nothing about uh, you know, this, this quantum from that. But I know enough that this is nonsense <laughs> to mention collapse of the wave function in a lecture like this, yeah. where we don't have the parameters to which the collapse of the wave function could be, We're going to have a uh, could, could happen or could be absurd. So what does yeah, that yeah. mean? Nothing, nothing. Have no connection with any reality, with any of this world that we live in. Now, uh, I, I am sorry to say that I was hoping today to rebut uh, uh, reels here uh, on, on the issue if God exists or not. But this has nothing to do with anything. It's a mumbo jumbo of nothing. Plastic shit. Plastic shit. I want to thank our speaker this evening. It's clear that he has been influenced by uh, the College of Complexes. Uh, <laughs> for good or evil. Uh, Pope Benedict XVI, in an encyclical entitled Nunc Imbecilius Odiae, uh, today at 10.30 Rome time, said, God does not exist. I read this on the Comedy Central website this morning. <laughs> it true. Uh, I'm a physicist. I'm a cosmologist. Uh, I'm a theoretical and experimental uh, cosmologist. Uh, but. Physicists are divided into two groups, basically, very broadly. There are experimentalists and there are theorists. Theorists come second. The, the, the uh, experimentalists are the observers. They're the ones who take the data. They're the ones who amass the data and then wonder, what does it mean? The theorists come along and propose or make up uh, explanations for what the data means. Uh, given those two situations, throughout history it's been that way. For example, in the old cosmology, uh, say from in, in uh, our ancestries, uh, the European model, uh, the Earth was the center of the universe and everything went around it. There was the stars were on a, a, a crystal sphere that rotated around the Earth. Now that worked for a while until uh, experimental scientists uh, began to make measurements. And then it became obvious that that was not the way it's going to go. One was a uh, German-Polish uh, priest, uh, Copernicus, Nikolai uh, Copernicus. Uh, he modified using his mind. He was a theorist now. He, he modified the old cosmology into what he thought was a more perfect heaven, which meant that the sun was at the center of the, uh, the universe, and uh, the planets went around the sun in perfect circles. He had no idea what the real situation was, but he, that, was it, that was his explanation as a theorist. Uh, along comes uh, Kepler, who made observations. He was a theorist, but he also used the data that had been collected by a Danish prince, Tycho Brahe. Uh, and he came to the conclusion that the planets actually, that the Earth was not at the center of the universe, that the Sun was at the center of our solar system, and the planets went around it in ellipses, all of them in ellipses. 
was, he, he was a mathematician as well as a, as a scientist. Um, we move ahead then uh, for several centuries uh, until uh, the telescope is, is, has become a, a major tool and we find uh, Messier and other uh, astronomers in Germany, France, England uh, looking at the sky through telescopes and they find these fuzzy objects out there. They don't know what they are. They look like clouds. In fact, Messier made a list of them, 101 uh, lists, so that other astronomers would not be fooled. They didn't move, so they, they must be clouds or something else. They couldn't be comets, for example. Uh, then we move ahead some more to 1928, when uh, uh, George, when, when Hubble, uh, looking through his telescope and using a spectroscope, a new tool of science, saw that the, the fuzzy objects out there were actually moving away from the Earth, from our galaxy. And he knew at that point that the, the, our universe was not restricted to our galaxy, but it was expanding. Marvelous concept. Einstein in this uh, situation had developed his equations and he put in a fudge factor, which he called lambda, uh, to make a static universe. He had to change that when Hubble showed that the universe was actually expanding. Uh, we move ahead then to 1998, uh, and we find that more data from galaxies at the far, far reaches of our ability to see with telescopes. Um, 13.78 billion light years. Um, the universe is not only expanding, it's e the expansion is accelerating. So it is conceivable, theorists say, that the universe will never, will never see the end of the universe. It's going uh, so, so far, so fast, we'll never, we'll never see the, the, the end of it. Um, move ahead then to 1998, to the period. 1998 to 2010, and we have new data now uh, showing that the universe, even the data is, is, is incontrovertible, but the theorists have constructed strange theories to explain all of this, but from the, the quantum mechanical levels on particles as well as to the universe in general. And uh, they invented things like uh, dark energy, dark matter, and uh, 11 dimensions in string theory. It, it, what the theorists do in this case is to invent a, a, a system of explanation that will not obviously conflict with the data. And they, they do that very well. Um, but to, in this year, so far this year, just in, in this month, at a conference in uh, Berlin, they have come to the conclusion that our universe had a beginning. Something started the universe. And it's based, of course, on the energy concept, on entropy. Uh, and uh, does that mean that there is a God? Or does it mean that the explanations for that were made up by the theorists are inconsistent? or maybe some other method of uh, explaining things will develop. I think that's the case. Just as Copernicus improved on the Earth-centered uh, universe and uh, Kepler on Co Copernicus. <coughs> um, but all of the, uh, all of the data, uh, all of the observations, all of the theories uh, were based on imperfect data. The more our, in, our scientific instruments are improved, the greater becomes the precision with which we can uh, make things up, invent things. Uh, going back then to uh, the spirit, uh, Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century said, uh, asked the question, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? And the answer to that was, it didn't matter because angels, the spirit in, in, uh, that are angels is immaterial. They're not a material thing, so there's a, a broad concept there. I do wish to correct our speaker's concept of entropy. 
uh, yes, the universe is becoming more and more disordered. That's true. But it, there are local events where things are becoming more and more organized. In our galaxy, stars are born uh, out of dust as a result of uh, gravitational attraction. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, I want to thank you, Ed. I've been coming to College of Complexes, and I've been listening to other people in other forums. We did an A job. Anybody that don't appreciate it, they weren't listening. They got their own agenda. Uh, you know, one guy could put on a white suit and a white shirt and draw a beard and put a pipe and put a little level on the smoke coat here. And he come up and he said, uh, yellow is heavier than green. <laughs> another guy come up and they on television and the other guy come up and he said, uh, no, no, green is heavier than yellow. Would you believe that this guy will have people standing behind him, supporting him? <laughs> this guy's over here would have out here supporting him? Guess what the philosopher would say? Guess what the fuck I would say? What the fuck is y'all talking about? That is nonsensical. That ain't worth shit. Go fuck yourself. That's what I would say, you know? Now, 90 percent of the goddamn world believe that there's somebody behind that motherfucking cloud. I don't want nobody rebelling against that. And that shit done caused more problems and more headaches. And it got more people in trouble to enslave more motherfuckers' mind and their physical bodies <laughs> than anything on earth. Yet, a goddamn dude stand over there talking about yelling more than that, the Big Bang, <coughs> uh, black holes, dark energy, dust, uh, uh, asteroid hit the earth and the dinosaur disappeared. All of these goddamn theories. <laughs> that I done read about, that I ain't heard none of the mainstream rebellion to fuck up, yes. <laughs> they, they eat that shit up. Well, I got news for you, man. I got good goddamn news for you. <laughs> if the guy wants to say, uh, 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 somebody behind the fucking cloud, I'm an atheist. If somebody wants to say behind the cloud, guess what? All I ask him to be intelligent. Guess who was intelligent when they argued for the man behind the cloud? St. Angelo, St. Augustine, St. Uh, uh, Thomas, Thomas, uh, Thomas Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, philosophers like Leibniz, philosophers like Radar Dick of Descartes, Aristotle said, I got to come up with some shit. We had to have something before this. And he called it the first mover. He wasn't eating chicken and molesting little boys. He didn't have no poor pit, but he was a human being. So he wanted to come up with something that makes sense. So he said the first move. Does that prove anything? No. But the Einstein talking this shit, what did he prove? Ain't proving a motherfucking thing. A asshole talking about he know when the world begins, when it don't end, ain't prove shit to me. So somebody goes to size this, size this, size my motherfucking ass. <laughs> and a lot of people you call side, scientists, take my word for it. All you got to do is stop being one tracted and use your goddamn mind and remember something. And quit suffering from Alzheimer's disease and in the now. <laughs> Some of our greatest inventions was brought about because of people that I call takeaways. They ain't had no PhD in this. I don't know Ford having no goddamn uh, engineering degree from MIT. Oh, some of our biggest inventions, they, they, some of our biggest dudes now, dropped out of college when they was in the sophomores and shit. Now they got the whole big Microsoft or whatever the fuck you want to do. I tell you time and time and fucking again that ain't no man got the absolute ass. If he did, his monkey ass wouldn't be in Rose Hill. <laughs> he would be living all the way. That's my position. I mean, that's my support. 
that ain't no fucking man got to ask gonna tell me nothing about when the war began, <laughs> evolution this, now stick all that up your ass. Because you don't know nothing about it. You wasn't there. <laughs> there are places on earth that now that people ain't never been. If you put everybody on earth together, they could all be in the state of Texas. And have some asshole gonna tell me you got a hundred thousand Insects, 10 million this and 10 million that, and he gonna tell me something about some fucking fruit fly? <laughs> Father Mendel, that got something to do with some evolution? Go fuck yourself. <laughs> However, there are people that benefit from what folks believe. Well, this true or false? <laughs> Most of it is false. Because if you believe in truth, you wouldn't get your ass used as much as you do. <laughs> T uh, 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 uh. They use science just like they use religion <coughs> to 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 you, uh, to, uh, to, to ins, uh, anesthetize the public. People, let me tell you this: a scientist is a human being, and he got two things that is hard to resist. One, he he can't resist. The first one he can't resist is his fucking limitation. He's a goddamn human being, and he can't walk on water. And he can't look through the wall. The second one is a human being has got temptations. And he got temptations that he hard to resist, boy. I'm telling you, because they're all kind. And you gonna tell me that this asshole ain't gonna say something if somebody involved, if some power involved, if this involved, over and over again, they done called scientists fabricating and lying. You'll find uh, assholes saying things that somebody else come by and have to straighten out. But nobody uh, want to attack that. Certain people don't want to attack that because that would be messing with the official version. The official version must be supported. The official version must be accepted. All this and that. Give me a break, please. A human being is a human being. He got limitation and he doesn't know all the things. And another thing why they use this theory shit and come up with all this old false shit that you can't prove to keep you dumb. You say, well, the kids ain't learning nothing in school. They can't learn nothing. You teach them all this nonsense and this theory about this and tomorrow that and, and 10 million years of that. Give me a fucking break, please. 10 years ago, you telling a student he's supposed to know something about 10 million years ago? And you gonna tell him something, he's supposed to know something about tomorrow? How the fuck you gonna know something about the future? And you don't even know what's happening today. Give me a break, please. <laughs> Thank you, Ed, for an interesting presentation. Something we all need to think about. And I give you points for just being brave enough to get up here and say what you had to say. I'd like to talk a little bit about the existence of God, a God, any God. There was a high school professor who was railing on Christianity. He was saying, I can't touch your God. I can't see your God. I can't feel your God. How do you know he's there? One of his students got up and said, do you believe in the air? I, you can't see air, you can't touch air. Sure you can. Come on, come on. You've never been to Gary. <laughs> hey, hey, Rick, it's a gas. We're going but you can feel the effect of it when the wind blows. When I start, you know it's there. <clears throat> you smell it, and then it's there. You want to come through it. You know, gas exists. It's air. air. What a great shit. Tim, for you to look at that, look at that. Right, I, am. Look at that. I often like the entropy thing too. My my story on entropy is I used to, when I was in school I used to tell my mom, Mom, entropy says that everything tends to its most disorganized state. And she still made me clean my bedroom. <laughs> Anytime you talk about any God or religion or anything, you always get into creation, which is based on Charles Darwin's Origin of the Species, which is an interesting thing, too, because 
when Darwin wrote the book and put forth his theory, he expected the scientists, his, his peers, to look at it and rip it up and chew it up and spit it out and in the normal scientific process that was discussed by our speaker. But that pretty much didn't happen. Why, why was evolution accepted so rapidly and so universally by the scientific community? One good reason, and it was given by a contemporary of Darwin, I don't know his name right off the top of my head, but he said that having a creator, if you have a creator or God, that gives you a moral obligation to the creator because the creator <coughs> made you, gave you everything you have, so there's a moral obligation. If there is no creator and everything's happened by chance, by accident, then there's no morality. And his quote was, having a creator gets in the way of our sexual mores. <laughs> So without a creator, there's no morality to get in the way of you doing whatever you feel like you want to do. Without a creator, there's no ethics. I said morality, I didn't say ethics. Somebody better tell the Greeks that. Or the creatures that raise their young. One last thing on, on uh, evolution. <laughs> I heard it, an analogy of evolution would be going up in an airplane, dumping off bags of mortar, water, and bricks, and expecting it to hit the ground as a brick wall. <laughs> That's about how likely evolution is. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You heard it. You, 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 you think we came from monkeys? <laughs> Yeah, you, your own Being known as Doug the Christian, I couldn't pass up the <laughs> coming to tonight's program. Yeah. And it was a very good attempt uh, explaining uh, belief and spirituality and God and all that. But I, I think there are a few holes that I felt I obligated to fill in. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. Uh, do you use mortar mix to fill in those holes? Right. Uh, one, and what blend the mortar mix? I think, you know, when you were talking about the explanation of God, the way uh, in, uh, Jewish tradition, uh, they had a single God, so to speak, and, and uh, the Muslims, they, you know, have Allah. But uh, in terms of the Christian God, there is one God, but what we say is there's three persons in one God. And, you know, I don't know if any of you are Catholic like I am, but, you know, at the Sunday Mass, every Sunday, we say uh, what we call the Nicene Creed, and this is a creed that was created back uh, about 300 A.D. in the early church. And uh, they went through a lot of trouble of identifying the three parts of God. In the first part of the creed, it talks about God the Father, God the Creator, and we literally say the maker of all things visible and invisible. Or and that's what the current reading is. Before we used to say seen and unseen, but it means the same thing. Uh, then in the second part of the creed, they talk about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, becoming man. And uh, as you were saying, uh, I think you were quoting from John that. Uh, Jesus was the Word of God made flesh. And then uh, in the third part of the creed we talk about the Holy Spirit being the same, equally uh, adored and glorified with the Father and the Son, and that we say He spoke through the prophets, meaning that all the, the, the Bible stories uh, were inspired uh, by the Holy Spirit uh, working through men. Uh, writing out the Word of God. So that that covers it from the Christian point. I, I thought that was important. Uh, some of the things, you know, going back to spirituality, you know, people having spirits, 
And, you know, uh, uh, one of the things, you know, the spirit is a definite mystery with us. I know uh, some of you are parents, you've had children, and, you know, for as far as your children are concerned, you can account for their genes, <laughs> the chromosomes you get. So it went 26 from the mother and 26 from the father, if I have it right. But at any rate, we're, the thing that we're never able to explain is where, do you, where does the child get its personality, its consciousness? And we know that consciousness is real because people die, and all you know for all of us who've been to funerals, I imagine everyone in the room, uh, you know that uh, you just see a body in that casket. You know where where has that person gone? And uh, to me, that that's kind of an indication that there is a real spirit in all of us. Now I went to Loyola University. And I took a class in philosophy called metaphysics. And one of the things that we talked about or learned in the class was that uh, everything has an essence. The essence of a dog is to be a dog. The essence of a cat is to be a cat. The essence of a man is to be a person. And, uh, you know, so in that sense, that sort of supports your idea uh, Ed, that everything has a spirit. Now, you know, we were getting into this thing that rocks have spirit, you know, and then uh, Frank said he didn't want to go to heaven with all the mosquitoes. <laughs> but uh, one, one thing uh, to keep in mind, and even in that regard, is, I don't know, have, have most of you watched WTTW during the fundraising, and, and they've had this Dr. Wayne Geyer, or Geyer on, and he, uh, he was talking at one time about the, uh, the source of life, you know, that that's what emanates from. And I think, you know, without really saying it, I think he was referring that this is the power of God, that God has the life. Now, you know, uh, the other thing I've talked about in past talks with you is about, like, uh, you know, we talk about uh, in the Bible, the uh, Garden of Eden, and I've come out and said, the whole earth could be considered to be the garden. I mean, everywhere you go on this planet, you find water and green, yeah, even in the Lord. farthest reaches, everywhere you even have a lot of desert, there's life in the desert. And the neighborhood. So, Some places don't have a snake. So the thing is, is that to get an idea, this is a, a pretty special place, because you look you know, to the moon, there's nothing on the moon, and the Mar uh, Mars planet, or any other planets, so we seem to have any indication of life. Or, and the fact is, is you know, uh, some of the other things, uh, we have an atmosphere that's breathable. None of us have to wear spacesuits to walk on the Earth. I mean, some places maybe, because the air isn't the best quality. But for the most part, you can uh, go up in an airplane and land, and you can just walk out from the plane. You don't need to have a, a spacesuit on to breathe oxygen, as you do when we go to the planets. Uh, the other thing is, is about the growing seasons on the Earth. You know, it, uh, scientists uh, sort of observed this, that uh, in the orbit of the Earth, that uh, the, er the Earth in relation to the Sun is at the right position uh, to support a, a growing season, you know, and in that sense, you know, every year we go through a cycle of harvesting and planting and, and uh, harvesting oh and grow, uh, well, you have a growth period during the summer and a harvest in the fall, you know, around the world. And so the Earth, you know, sustains itself that way, and even uh, within the Earth, you know, we have uh, volcanoes, but you know, while the richest soil is, is is what comes out in the lava from the volcanoes. Why did God and make all them goofy planets then? And uh, I, well, I'm sure <laughs> so, uh, so at any rate, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I thought Ed's concept of uh, being a, a theoretical spiritualist uh, was interesting. Uh, something to think about. And then he raised the consciousness, would we ever have a machine that had consciousness? And Hollywood's kind of dabbled in that. I just saw this past week a movie called Short Circuit. Have most of you have seen Short Circuit in the past? It was about a robot that uh, was essentially a war type instrument and then uh, there was a lightning strike and then this robot stopped uh, thinking and became uh, a thought like a person. Oh. And also, I want to just squeeze in one more thing. 
the computer in uh, uh, Space Odyssey 2001, HAL 9000, he was uh, he had sensitivity and also he uh, was a murderer. Uh, he killed the astronauts that were that were on the spaceship. So uh, you know that could be the side effects of machines getting consciousness. Thank you. Oh, by the way, uh, if any of you are around on May 12th, I'll be talking more about super strength theory and God. Come back. We're not done with this stuff. It's coming back. It's coming back. Oh, Margaret. We got him in May. Alrighty. Um, just because I slept through most of the talk doesn't mean that I shouldn't get up. I'm sorry. This is past my bedtime. Um, all right. Um, I guess, you know, you tried to say that observation is not science, that when people come out with results and publish results, and the results are found to be false, that's not science. And none of that is, is true. I mean, scientists, one of the things that scientists do, and um, Joe made a really nice point about being experimental and theoretical, but one of the things that scientists do is observe what is going on. And that's the beginning of, of science. And so, in fact, humans um, have been actually scientists for all of our history as homo sapiens, because we experiment with the, with the world. Where's the best place to fish? Where's the best place to hunt? In this, in, in this season, this wa the water is here, but in the, in, the, in the late summer, this water hole is dried up. And so we do, and, and we can't hunt around there. So we, we've always done trial and error. We've always done experiments with what things work. And this, this particular arrow point doesn't do as well, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the whole point about science that um, people miss is, you know, when you, when you have like 80% or 70% of the, of the scientific efforts are not reproducible, that's the point, is you put out your findings and then people try to reproduce them to see if it's something that can be generalized from what you did, or it's just because in your laboratory, the, the guy who did the housekeeping threw out the wrong garbage every night. So um, the, the, the fault is, in fact, in the publication of this in the late press, where um, the, uh, you know, we want to glom on to the cure for cancer. And so when someone comes up with something promising, then the headline said, cure for cancer is found. And then the, uh, the things can't be reproduced, the findings can't be reproduced. They did this with cold fusion, that there was uh, a couple of scientists in uh, Utah or something, which is the, the a hotbed of science, I must say. Um, they did the cold uh, fusion uh, experiments, and they said, we can create energy with this cold fusion, and now we'll have an unlimited energy source, and no one was able to reproduce it. So that's the, and you know, then everybody said cold fusion, cool, really good, and, and we'll have energy, but they couldn't reproduce it. So that's the point of science. You put your stuff out there, you do your thing, you do the best you can with it, you put it out there. If people can't reproduce it, then it's not something that we can use. It's only something that you could do in your own laboratory on the specific conditions in your laboratory. So it, the findings cannot be generalized to, to other places. That's all a part of science. Um, and so, when, you know, that's the, and that's the scientific method. And the scientific method is not you, 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 you put out a theory and then you test it and then you modify it. That is not the scientific method. You observe things. Darwin's writings is filled filled with pages and pages and pages of observations. If, uh, if I don't know that anybody, most people here have not read Darwin, but uh, you know he's got pages and pages and pages of observations, drawings of the finches' beaks and all those other things. Um, about and then finally he comes up with what why 
the, the, why did things, to, why do animals to, uh, change to, uh, and, and he came up with natural selection. So, um, and the reason that it was adopted was not because he brought it out first and all of a sudden a bunch of people said, oh, that sounds cool. The, th the theory of evolution had been around for a while before he brought, before he really, uh, before he published The Origin of the Species. And, and there was another scientist who was going to publish at the same time who came up with, uh, I believe it's Wallace, who came up with the same kind of thing. And, and he was going to publish at the same time, and so Darwin published his findings first. But he had been working on it for 30 years or something before he published. Um, at any rate. So, but his grandfather actually was talking about change over time and all of those things. Um, the second thing that I would really want to object to is without God there is no morality. That's really a crock of shit. Thank you very much. Um, you know, the, the morality is, to, uh, you can really show that morality, and, and, and there's all kinds of, of thoughts about this, and I'm not up on the philosophy or anything, but you know, when you, you can show that people who kill other people are not really acceptable in human society. And people who rob from other people are not really accepted in your community. And so you exclude them. And if you were a tribe, a hunting tribe, and you excluded somebody, they died. Because they couldn't get, they re, it's really hard, even with Atlas Shrugged and all that other crap, that it's, it, if you're in uh, a hunter-gatherer society, which we were for the first hundred and, and I don't know, uh, depending on how old you think Homo sapiens is, 150,000 to 200,000 years is what the um, anthropologists <coughs> think. You know, until just the last I, uh, pastoral, pastoral things where we uh, domesticated animals and, and then had herds, and, and agriculture probably wasn't developed like, I, you know, maybe, maybe 10,000 years ago or something. So for all the rest of that time, we were hunter-gatherers. We were in small groups. We were actually, our population was much less because we, could, we, we really couldn't increase our population at that. And if you got excluded, if you got isolated from your tribe because you were an obnoxious son of a bitch, then you probably didn't do too well because you got out there and you got injured and man, you were stuck. You didn't do anything, and, and the nearest animal just ate you right up, the nearest predator. So that, that we develop ways of acting to each other um, based on the fact that, you know, if you're really obnoxious, you don't do well. So that doesn't have anything to do with God. And a lot of, of um, and I'll just do a saying, that, um, you know, there are people who do good things, and there are people who do bad things. But for someone who's really good to do a bad thing, you need religion. Because <laughs> yeah. that provides them with the rationale that the person that they are um, opposed to, who is a different whatever than they are, and their religious leader said, God is on our side, we are right, and, and the other person is wrong and not one of us, and the slaughter that's resulted from that in the world has been caused by religion. Well, I have to agree with Margaret that uh, when you have values, You have values, you uh, have good and you have bad, and that comes from uh, a meaning, and if you don't have any feelings or, or spirit or life, uh, <laughs> there isn't much meaning, and there isn't much value, and there's no imperative. So, and the science of religions 
are the religions uh, of the sciences uh, help us to adapt to our world and each other and understand uh, what is important and not. Uh, but uh, if uh, what, what Ed has been talking about has not been a religion or a god, but a spirit. And uh, I'm afraid that uh, Ed's spirit is sort of an oblong blur. Uh, he can't define it. Um, uh, it's not like the, the spirit uh, that moved across the waters uh, and gave meaning uh, light and dark, uh, solid and uh, chaotic. Uh, well, that spirit's been yeah, the, if, if you look at the, the genesis, uh, you know, from a philosophical uh, interpretation of, of myth, uh, uh, it is myth. Uh, it, it, it's not an explanation of who the god uh, that gave the uh, commandments is, uh, and how that god is different from the worshippers of light or of darkness uh, or of uh, various animals and their spirits uh, or uh, or even of humanism, uh, uh, a religion of man. Uh, it, it, it has a philosophy to it and it can be a help in uh, guiding our thinking. Uh, that's why it is religious. Um, uh, spirit, or life, uh, does give meaning to everything. And that's the, the point uh, of uh, the creation story. Uh, that everything in life has meaning given by life. Uh, by, and we, we sense that through, through uh, our feelings, our spirit. Uh, God speaks to us, and uh, the uh, spirit that doesn't speak, that doesn't actuate us, is not our God. Uh, a God, even, you know, Mars was the god of the soldier. Uh, uh, Venus, uh, the god of, of love, of, uh, uh, of lust. And, you know, these, these gods demanded certain worship, uh, certain sacrifices that you would make. Now, uh, polytheists uh, would say, you know, uh, you worship uh, one god in one temple, and, and maybe uh, you have the, the god of a, a certain class or caste or trade or profession or uh, ethnic group, and that is the god that binds you. Uh, I only have a little over a minute left. Uh, so, let's see. It, it might be that the science of a theoretical physicists is inadequate to explain things, but positing what is called uh, by uh, Ed a uh, spirit uh, has not added uh, much for me because uh, his spirit uh, is such an oblong blur. Uh, 
uh, it's not, it doesn't define him or uh, anything. It doesn't command uh, the spirit that animated the, the, uh, the good Samaritan in Jesus' parable, commanded him to act and to be a neighbor uh, to the injured man uh, the, had, who had fallen among thieves. And that is, that is commonly understood as, as love. Now that's the Holy Spirit, uh, if we want it. And you can point to what is the action of the Holy Spirit in people. Uh, and uh, you, don't, you don't really have uh, a God without the worshiper. Uh, and uh, the, uh, that's why uh, Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, in uh, Christian theology. Yeah, All right. Um, Rob Brown, all I have to say is that only sheep need a shepherd. Throw a rocket. Throw a rocket. So, uh, Ed, uh, even though uh, I mean, it takes a lot of courage to get up here at the college in front of the microphone for uh, for a session, especially if you're talking about something as contentious as uh, religion or spirit, or anything supernatural or anything like that. However, I'm not going to lambast you. Uh, rather, uh, you know, I'm going to bring up uh, uh, John Stuart Mill, who's, uh, whose book on liberty made a big, big impression on me when I read it in, for the Political Economy Book Club a year or two ago. Uh, and that is that, uh, you know, any opinion really is is uh, worth hearing, even if it's, uh, you know, or an idea, even if it's uh, not widely held or widely believed. And uh, uh, certainly talk about spirits and college complexes falls into, into that category. Uh, and uh, so anyway, that was, you know, that was something John Stewart Mill said, I mean, you know, Everything needs to be aired out, and uh, likewise, though you know, then we are we have the liberty to, to criticize everything as well. Nothing is beyond criticism, and that's always been a problem with religion uh, throughout the years. Is that it's been taboo sometimes to talk about it or to criticize it. But uh, you know, I think uh, like John Stuart Mill says, it should all be out there on the table for examination. The most outlandish idea, whether one person in the world holds their view or whether everybody holds the uh, view, particular view, should be out there. Including now, uh, what's that? Including Henry George. Well, including that, uh, yeah, sure, Henry George. That's, that's just you know, wrong. It's an un unpopular <laughs> opinion uh, of George. Well, Even that's mostly because most people don't understand it. But, but, uh, but if certainly amongst uh, landowners, they're, you know, they're, they're going to fight against it. Uh, I'm going to bring up uh, this, this young lady in, uh, in Rhode Island right now. There's this current the uh, shit storm going on out there. Has anybody heard about the story of, of Jess yeah. Owner? Yeah. Yeah. Alphus, yeah. Do you have a, do, do you have Twitter? No. Oh, okay, well uh, you should get on follow her on Twitter. It's just at her Twitter account is at Jessica Alquist. All one word. My Twitter is Bob Matter One, if any of you want to follow me. Well at Bob Matter One. But anyway, I've been following this as it unfolds on Twitter, it's been quite interesting because you know it's kind of real updates, things happening. Briefly, briefly uh, uh, Jessica uh, Alquist uh, was a sophomore at uh, Cranston High School in uh, Cranston, Rhode Island, and she noticed this banner hanging in the auditorium that was a school prayer. It even said school prayer right above it, and it started with Heavenly Father, and it ended with Amen, and the middle was a bunch of moral jibber-jabber about, uh, you know, Help, help guide us Moral through theory, diversity yeah. and uh, you know things like that. You know all this good sounding stuff. You know, <laughs> but uh, anyway, but it is in fact a Christian yeah. prayer. I mean, nobody refers yeah. 
to God as, as a heavenly father, except Christians, specifically Catholics. And, uh, uh, and nobody says amen also except Catholics, or except, except Christians. Uh, so as an atheist, she felt excluded. And also, if anybody was Muslim or a Jew or not a non-Christian, they would also feel some exclusion. So this violates the separation clause in the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law, uh, you know, uh, about religion. Uh, yeah, about uh, uh, religion, about creating a religion, or establish. establishing a religion. That's right. It's the establishment so, clause. Right. So, uh, so she went to the school board meeting and said this needs to go, this is clearly a violation, and there's been lots and lots of similar cases, and the school board said, no, it's staying, it's tradition, it's history, it's art, you know, they had all these other excuses, and they said it's staying. So she contacted the ACLU, and they said, yeah, well, you know, we'll take this to court, so then she became the plaintiff, and the ACLU provided the lawyers, and this ended up going to court. Well, now, fast forward about a year, just the other day, about a week or two ago, now actually Jessica's a junior now in high school, uh, a judge ruled that in her favor and said, yes, this banner has to come down. This thing is huge. It's about eight feet tall. It's huge. It hangs above the doorway of an auditorium. And it's painted on, actually. So, but what the school's done now is they've covered it up with a tarpaulin. And there's a big shitstorm. A big shitstorm has formed. Now people are... Uh, you know, threatening this poor girl or everything. She had to change high schools. They had another board meeting recently. I saw some, some videotape of it that somebody shot. And all these townspeople were in there wearing these cardboard signs around their neck that said appeal. You know, so they want to they want to appeal this, this ruling. And uh, meanwhile, uh, Jessica's gotten all this uh, popular, you know, acclaim from the atheist community is rallying behind her. She's got 10,000 followers on Twitter now. Hamat Mata, who, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, Mata, Hamat Mata, the guy who wrote uh, I Sold My Soul on eBay, and he spoke here once, he also spoke at the Center for Inquiry, He's, he has a great blog, you know, called Friendly Atheist, he set up a little uh, scholarship fund for Jessica, and people have donated $30,000 already to that scholarship fund, matter of fact, I, I kicked in 10 bucks myself. Uh, and it's probably quite a bit more by now. But anyway, and uh, also the Freedom From Religion Foundation uh, established a new $10,000 scholarship to, for brave atheists or something that do these kind of attacks and uh, or, or suffer from these from these attacks of Christians. Right? And uh, they made Jessica Alpus the first recipient of it. So she's got 10000 coming from them, plus 30000 so far from... Uh, just the private individuals that have raised. So I urge you to uh, look, look her up on the internet, follow her on Facebook. She has a uh, Facebook page, not only her private page, but, but she has a, uh, you know, I support Jessica Alpha's page, or I support removing the banner from Cranston High School. But if you just Google for Cranston and Jessica, you'll, you'll see it. Yeah. She's been going around speaking at engagements. She, she's going to be speaking at the Reason Rally in Washington, D.C. Uh, coming up uh, in... Uh, well, it's coming up in March, I think, or April, March, yeah, I think March, March or April, Washington, D.C. It's warm. It's a one-day thing. They're going to have a bunch of atheists down there talking, and they're free thinkers and stuff. Of tell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, anyway, I also want to mention in John Stuart Mill's book, by the way, on liberty, uh, he also uh, talks about, I guess, what Ed was saying, the spirit, uh, although he, he refers to it as internal life forces, and he also refers to it as energy. And, uh, you know, you can direct the people that, uh, that, that uh, direct uh, this, this energy, uh, you know, you can direct it for good things or, or for bad things. Okay. Hi, Paul. Oh. <laughs> I will have to say there was one scientific premise that was proven tonight, and that is sometimes when you get a the material is not as presented as well as it can be, it tends to put people to sleep. I did the same thing two weeks ago with the overabundance of video. So, with that being said, 
that, you know, you remind me a lot of what happened to me right in college around my sophomore year. And that was I had the classic conversion experience to Christianity. And the next, very next thing that happened to me after that was, is this real? Does this make any scientific sense? Does it have any provability or any of these other things? And today I'm still satisfied with some of the results I've found, but I'm still in a somewhat of a quandary about the very essence of that question. But I will say what it, your speech reminded me of was a simple breakdown of what somebody else has already written about it. This gentleman's name is C.S. Lewis. And a lot of the stuff that he has taught you touched upon tonight were just basically chapter one of his book called Mere Christianity. Now, for those of you guys who don't know about C.S. Lewis, he was an atheist and became, about his mid-40s, a follower of Christianity and went on to major acclaim you know, in, in the publishing world for Christian authors. He also was married for a brief four years and I, to his uh, wife, and he was left after, four, she died of cancer four years later, and he was left with two adolescent sons. And there was a movie written about her that I'm forgetting the name of right now. There was also another gentleman in the mid-1980s. His name, he wrote a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. His name is Josh McDowell. And he wrote, not, he was, a, again, an atheist in college, but he said to himself, these are some questions that really demand an answer. Next thing you know, he has a 300-page book on the subject, on evidence demands a verdict. He then went on to produce another book called More Evidence Demands a Verdict. And again, he touches on these very questions that you're asking about. And the most, most contemporary version right now the pastor at Willow Creek, at, um, Paul Hoon, uh, at Willow Creek Church, Community Church out in South Barrington. Uh, Talking about a case for Christ? Yes, a case for Christ. Uh, who he was the, an atheist, too. Yeah, he was an atheist. What was his name? I forget his name. Yeah. He, uh, he, be, he became a Christian while trying to disprove Christianity as an atheist. He, when he really yeah, looked yeah. at it, yeah. he said, this is, I know the name. Yeah, um, Jeff, uh, we'll, we'll figure it out later on. But what I'm simply saying is this, you know, my path is much different As an than your path. Was trying to this path has caused me, and as he looked within evidence, about 12 hours from now, I'll be if, going to worship God at Springbrook Community exist. Church in Huntley, Illinois. And I will be there, you know, fully participating in the service, probably doing what I do here, videotaping, because they did put me in the production booth. But I'm not here to blast anybody's religious faith or their paths tonight because I do realize that people need to make this decision on their own. And from whatever I have, from what I have learned about Christianity and everything else is that if there is a God, he's not a coercive God. You have to give your full consent to what you believe in and how you believe in him. And that one of the gifts we have from him is the ability for free will and free choice. With that, I'll just say good luck on your quest. I hope a couple of the book suggestions I've made will help it through. And thank you. I believe that everybody here realizes that they're not just a clump of, of uh, chemicals. So I, I don't take too seriously a denial of the soul. Every, if you take a, make a list of all the things you do, you realize you're more than any of that. If you get sick, you don't think you're diminished. You still realize you're the person you are. And then when you... Uh, so, uh, uh, this, this is I my uh, Lee prediction, and I, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I sort of uh, believe that there might be something more than that, but I believe that we all do have a soul. All right, you guys all have souls, huh? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ed. <laughs> Let's see, I'm going to be eclectic as usual here. Um, 
First of all, regarding theoretical physics, I guess it's all sorts of deficiencies, according to Ed here, and they don't conduct experiments. That's why it's called theoretical, I would think. <laughs> um, Einstein's even theory, he didn't, but experiments verified Einstein's theory of relativity. And he did uh, experiments himself, too. Yeah, the, well, the best one was the one with the eclipse. And, was it 23? No, no. He did yeah. experiments in which he Brilliant won motion. the Nobel Prize. That's right. For electric yeah. effect. And he yeah. did the experiment. Okay. Uh, yeah, but your, your basic premise is, is that there are deficiencies in, if you want, cosmology or the world of physics. And therefore, there's like a pie. And I guess your theory is, is that there's a slice missing. And you think you can put this slice in and make the pie whole by the introduction of a concept called spirit, I, which I think has been defined as something Ed called humanism. Uh, it's not really theology. And when you can't explain something, that doesn't mean that you latch on to any explanation whatsoever. Let it remain unexplained. And we cannot be intellectually lazy. You say there's a thing called spirit. You can't define it. You cannot, con you have not conducted any experiments to do. You know, if there are defects and omissions in the body of human knowledge, uh, there's no compelling necessity to accept anything at that point until such time as we have real knowledge to put in there. Uh, I mean, you know, what's this spirit? What's this mojo? Or, you know, I was wondering what, what is this? You know, uh, no, the, uh, let, let the body of human knowledge progress. We, we, in the intellectual history of mankind, we wasted, I estimate, at least 1,000 solid years by embrace, embracing uh, all kinds of peculiar concepts. And a few years, 100 years ago, we decided to put an end to this, at least those of us in the human community, we have some commitment to progress. Now, if it gives meaning to your lives and so forth, to embrace some of these other concepts, please be my guest. You know, we don't prohibit you from doing so. But uh, trying to disparage the scientific community, uh, I don't think you're going to succeed in that. It's had some very, very dramatic results <laughs> and far beyond anything that was furnished by theologians and to some extent even the philosophical community. Now to say that there's no ethics without a, a creator preposterous. It's, it's like the whole branch of that. There's only half a dozen major topics in philosophy. And if you want, Margaret was talking about anth cultural anthropology. Certainly there's ethics in the world. And in none of it has any relevance or needs any, any deity whatsoever. Uh, the, most of the ethics doesn't, it's not pivoted on it in any way, shape, or form. The other thing is about this thing about bricks and dropping them from the sky and the probability <laughs> of evolution and things like that. I think you have to look at the concept of deep time. Whether you like it or not, evolution happens. It's not, it's not even debatable anymore. I often go to the Smithsonian, and I don't know why this is still debated at all. They, they put together a complete fossil record. At the time, there were a lot of horses. They did the horse. There's nothing missing. 
Not any whatsoever. No question about it whatsoever. And yet you don't want to accept this. So you think the rest of the animal kingdom is not apart from the process to which the horse is a part? Or, you know, humans are not part of that process? Or what do we do with this thing that they would display? It's very famous. Because once it was done, there were no more arguments for about 50-some oh, years. They said, well, that's pretty much it, man. You know, it's, it's right there. Anybody can see it. and You can follow the, the evidence from little tiny creatures like this all the way through to a big horse. It's all there. It's played out and you say, well, this is how the process works. I, I don't, you know, man, separating parts of the animal kingdom uh, no, that's not the current model. The worst thing, as a matter of fact, they don't like that notion there. They were putting, well, doesn't, here is the, here's the one thing that's wrong about, it. now that I think about it, I got a few minutes. As your cosmology is something like here, there's, there's hierarchical things. It's, it's, that's what Christianity and theology says. There's God, angels, man, women, animals, plants. Yeah. The current model is circular. Everything works together. And there's there's you know spirit and things like that, whether or not, yeah, it pertains. I don't I just don't know where it fits in or serves us intellectually to finish it. I really don't. I think it generates infinitely more questions than it than it solves. But if you want to think there's there's nothing wrong with humanism that we don't have feelings and emotions for one another and things like that and identify that. But that's not some sort of entity in the universe. That's that's part of our being humans and uh, what we call that we have feelings and emotions and something, if you want, called the psychology and things of that nature. But there's nothing spectacular we are understandable. I mean, even there's a psychology is a science too, by the way, which it conducts experiments and explains a lot of this. Anyhow, thanks a lot. You enjoyed it here. Thank you. Yeah. You guys, you don't want you don't want to listen, Frank, do you? You don't want to believe. You want to go to your science. Let's have him rebut. Let him rebut. Uh, one of the reasons that I, I present this discussion in front of the college is to learn. Last time I was here talking about consciousness, I did learn things. And today also I've taken things away. And this helps me. Um, there, some misunderstanding and some disagreements. Disagreements are on a Avoidable misunderstandings I'd like to correct. Um, no, I, I, I don't talk about religion. Um, a deist is even too strong a word. Um, I do like the scientific method, the scientific process. What I was saying about the lack of reproducible results is that these it's not a theory. This is not a theory that people put forward. You know, this is something that people publish as experimental result that just isn't reproducible. And you look and you say, I look, and I say, what are they doing? Science. That's um, what they're doing. They're not doing. I don't know if they're doing science you, because you, you don't understand. It's like that. if if your result is a failure, it, you do your another result one, is a man. failure. You know, why do you publish it in the journal? It depends because on which journal. Because it needs to be analyzed by other people. The journal of shit let science. Let him finish. Please. No. But yes. he's repeating the and same old shit. Nothing, <laughs> in, the, <laughs> nothing in the heavyweight uh, journals is baloney. The speaker is summing up. <clears throat> There's five or ten percent of the journals are meaningful. The rest of them are like our philosophy club newsletter. 
I'm serious. Uh, Charles, you may be serious, may but be you're out of order. All right, so I am. Good deal. <laughs> <laughs> Throw me out. <laughs> um, <coughs> well, the point only ten of us here. The point of um, paths and people being on their paths, and you know, yeah, that's what this is. You know, those of you who are on a path, you know, follow it. I, that path is not something I can live with. It, it doesn't make complete sense to me. Charlie, your idea of my seeing a pie that's missing a piece probably comes the closest to what I was trying to say here. Um, and that's where I'm at. So thank you for your help. All right. <laughs> Are you available sure, for questions on, on computer? I would like to ask questions. Sure. You know, this one is trying to